Kahik Polisaha on Retish, Augusta Ari, a Vemar Ror von Usuk, nor Yentri and Aru, and a Mincha Tossig. Shokri Lar and the Hibra in Nov. Ganaris, Kafra Hishkint, Augusta Corson Arav, Keko Toktox is a Taun Law Nov, the Hakti Dala Idaho. Do shoot a Taik Fog Oil on Retis, Toshimar Holasako. Gorecha de Fibleda Kofastil, or Winter Naherden, Egan Lavel of Arda. Doshu de Tade Kappa, Mar Ari Shinshurka, Tokush Fordagwiv, a Veb Roduil, as a Will Bintamakagwiv, Agus Asanardu Kema Shah Inuv. On behalf of my party, I would like to congratulate those who have been promoted. I know that each of you has behind you your family, your friends, and supporters who have the right to be proud of your nominations to serve in government and also of their roles in helping you uh, to reach this day. Our new Tawnish State Deputy Burton secured an overwhelming endorsement from the activists of the Labour Party uh, to lead her party. And this is the pinnacle of a long career. It is absolutely clear that she has benefited from the exceptional support and encouragement of our family, and we extend to her our congratulations on her achievement again. It is natural that much of the coverage of today's reshuffle will be about personalities. The winners and losers will be raked over, and undoubtedly stories will emerge of deep arguments and disappointments. We've heard some already. However, this must not distract us from the substance. It is not the personalities that matter, but the policies they implement. And all the evidence is that very little will change because of this reshuffle. It's a bit like cosmetic surgery, except nothing major uh, has changed. The public want a new direction, not just new faces but they have not got that new direction. As the Taoiseach and Taunish have just said, they believe that they've been fundamentally correct in the last three and a half years. Yet today they are publishing a new policy document, or shortly as the Taoiseach said, after spending the last few days essentially tinkering around the edges of the programme for government rather than making any significant policy changes. They think that they may have communicated badly. They may have made a few mistakes. But they do not see what the rest of the country sees, a government which has been deeply unfair and which has created a two-tier recovery, a government which abandoned most of its promises on the day after the election, a government which has put politics first in everything it does. According to them, they are unpopular because of tough decisions. This is nonsense. They are unpopular because so many of their decisions have been unfair have caused avoidable damage and have been about managing the news cycle rather than shaping a better future for all parts of our society. If you look back at the budgets and major announcements of this government, you find a constant effort to make claims which were the direct opposite of the truth. Every one of them has been sold as being fair, protecting the weakest, spreading recovery, decisive and visionary. To be fair to the government, its emphasis on spin has often succeeded in terms of headlines and commentary. However, this immense campaign of spin has rebounded on the government. The people who claim to have delivered a democratic revolution while at the same time actively and significantly tightening government control of the Oireachtas are not being listened to by a public which has grown cynical of everything, it says. The long list of issues which the Taoiseach and Taunished have sought to claim credit for in their speeches is yet more of the same. As the OECD recently reported, the overwhelming reasons for improvements in the economy has been a combination of international circumstances and the long-term strengths of the Irish economy, particularly the skills of our people. Public finances have benefited from a series of major changes in European Union policies, particularly interest rate cuts negotiated by other countries and extended automatically to Ireland. The OECD itself, in a report requested by the government, exposed the spin when it said that it could not point to a specific effect the government's job plans have had on employment. That was a diplomatic way of saying, don't try and use us to back up your claims to have created thousands of jobs. However, both Irish and international studies do agree one thing, that Fine Gael and Labour have had a significant impact in one area. They have made fiscal policy dramatically more regressive. They replaced the policy of putting the biggest burden on those with the most to one of putting the biggest burden on those with the least. As new taxes and charges mount, as new taxes and charges mount, 
Uh, sorry, Deputy Matters of the floor, and please, without interruption. Just like to point out, of course, that I did give the T-shirt to Tonish to, uh, without any interruption, yes, their opportunity to speak. Yes. I would like if we could have some uh, 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 gesture towards democracy from a very rattled yes. Labour Party backbenchers, yes. and they're looking more rattled by the day. But could I make the point that the, as I said earlier, the facts are clear. For the first time in 20 years, the budget documentation this year did not include figures on the impact of cha charge, uh, cha changes on different uh, economic levels. And as new taxes and charges mount, and remember, there were 10 new tax increases in 2012, 20 in 2013, and a further 10 in 2014. That's Tisha, was your commitment to workers over, over the last three years in terms of your budget and your comment in relation to taxation. But the bottom line is this, Fine Gael and Labour sent out hundreds of press releases claiming to be fair and to be helping the coping classes but tried to hide the details of yet another regressive budget last October. For three and a half years, much of the government was living in denial, operating under the belief that the public would give them credit for every positive development, whether or not they had made it happen. They also hoped that they could keep running their speeches from the last election, so people would blame the last government for everything negative, no matter how much the policies were linked to decisions of Labour and Fine Gael ministers. In May, this strategy, however, this strategy in May came to a crashing halt for the first time, even its most uncritical and naive supporters understand that the public is angry with this government. The public doesn't just want a change of faces. It wants a major change of direction, and it is not getting it. As confirmed last Monday by Minister Noonan, all the public is getting is another public relations campaign. He let the cat out of the bag when he said that all that was being discussed was a nuancing of the programme for government agreed three and a half years ago. There will be an effort to show some concern on a handful of areas, but the core policy programme remains the same. The Tornish has talked at length over the last month about a new approach to Labour's participation in this government. She has implied that major changes are on the way. The detail of what has been announced shows this to be more empty, empty rhetoric. The Tornish has sought the EU Commissioner position for Deputy Gilmore and the Department of Jobs and Enterprise and Innovation for the Labour Party. But she has successfully negotiated responsibility for the property tax and water charges uh, in, in terms of giving responsibility to the Department of Environment. Really, two major issues, please, two major issues that the Labour Party opposed in opposition and said they would not implement. It has been, please, you know, how often, how often does the Labour Party have to roll over in this government? It's incredible in terms of, of what you've negotiated in contrast to what you actually sought in advance of the Let's negotiation order, on the reshuffle uh, of the Cabinet itself. And what is most striking is that the Minister has identified as priorities, or the Tornish has, areas where she personally played a significant role in creating the problems Shh. in the first place. Since the election, the Tornish has specialised in a major conjuring trick of being, both, of being both part of the government and distancing herself from it. And you know all about that, Minister Howland. Most journalists have, at some point, printed articles about all, how unhappy she has been with Labour's performance in government. And she's encouraged the idea that the worst policies would never have happened if she'd been in control. If you look at her record as Minister for Social Protection, the false claim that she's been a lone fighter for greater fairness is exposed. Time after time, she's implemented changes and cuts while trying to pretend that they were socially progressive when they, when they were the exact opposite. Not only has she agreed policies at Cabinet, which have imposed new charges and taxes on people below the living wage, she's led the charge in her own department. Because they were missing from the speeches we have just heard, we should remember the sheer scale of her targeting of low-income groups. The Tornishta cut child benefit, cut job seekers allowance for young people, cut paternity benefit, cut the back-to-school footwear and clothing allowance, abolish the cost of education allowance, cut the respite care grant, abolish the redundancy rebate, slash the household benefits package, abolish the telephone allowance, cut job seekers benefit, cut disability allowance for young people, though this was reversed under pressure, cut fuel allowance, cut one parent family allowance, undermined pharmacist, and abolished the bereavement grant. Whatever the tarnish has been in this government, a dissident from its unfair policies is not one of them. Last Tuesday, in a presentation to our party, the St Vincent de Paul Society told us that households with children and lone parent families in particular 
are now top of the queue looking for their help and assistance. There is a sense of despair and hopelessness out there which blights life for many people unable to see a better future for themselves or their families. We have now been told Deputy. that social housing is to be a new priority following the Labour election. There is no doubt. There is no doubt that there is currently a major social housing crisis which has escalated dramatically in the past year. As every deputy knows, as every deputy knows, the biggest driver, the truth hurts, the truth clearly hurts, the biggest driver of this has been the restriction on the rent supplement scheme that were brought in by the Taunashton. Every day new cases emerge of families being forced into critical situations. The minister who promoted and implemented this policy is now Taunashton and telling us now how concerned she is about social housing. We are told that Labour is getting environment to control the housing agenda. This must be a great surprise to Deputies Penrose and O'Sullivan, who have actually held responsibility for housing at the Cabinet for the past three and a half years. I mean, who do people think they are cutting? Labour is getting environment to control housing. You've had housing policy for the last three and a half years. Uh, and Deputy and Minister Janet Sullivan is well aware of that. Order. If, the government, if the government were sincere on social housing, the first thing it would do would be to abandon its policy, abandon its policy on the rent allowance, abandon its policies. The first thing, the first thing, the first thing the government should do is to abandon, is to abandon its policy on rent allowances. Because this policy on rent allowances is causing enormous problems out there. You can shout and heckle all you like, but everyone who knows anything knows it's a real issue out there. Because the rent allowance changes are forcing people, they force people into squalor or far away from their communities. And that is the bottom line, and that is the truth. This is the same government, of course, that has introduced the property tax, and which is doubling it this year, despite the fact that over 93,000 mortgages are in arrears for over three months, and the fact that 35,000 homeowners have not been able to pay their mortgage for over two years. Despite this, Phil and Gale and Labour insist that the mortgage issue should be left in the hands of the banks, rather than introducing an independent mortgage resolution office that Fianna Fáil suggested over three years ago. The much heralded insolvency legislation has not delivered tangible benefits. At the end of March, there were only four insolvency arrangements concluded. And this brings into clear focus the warning Fianna Fáil made at the time that that legislation was going through the door. The Tarnished, uh, the tarnished Day may well, have stored, may well have stored her Gilmore for Taoiseach posters in the garden shed, but she has no such alibi for the large and still growing list of broken promises and unfair decisions which she and her colleagues have been responsible for. One of the great challenges remaining or remains not just the creation of jobs, but the creation of decent and sustainable jobs. The government's jobs policy to date has been about claiming credit for jobs rather than actually making an impact. This is the government which went around the country, closing enterprise centres so that they could be renamed and reopened with a fanfare. The same has happened with many enterprise and innovation initiatives. The most recent government report on action on jobs goes as far as to claim as a new action research centres which have been open for over a decade. We need a minister who puts aside the spin and gets serious with the crisis still faced by small to medium sized enterprises. They have no access to finance, they face punitive charges and are tired of a government which claims everything is fine when it manifestly isn't. The two tier recovery will be entrenched unless our small to medium sized enterprises are supported and it is significant that this is not a priority for the reshuffled government. Retailers and businesses in towns across Ireland are in deep trouble and no radical change in direction has been heralded for them. I wish Deputy Alan, Alan Kelly well in his new role. He has already said himself, wait for it, cues. he has already said himself, the goal, he has already set himself the goal of reorganising and rebuilding the Labour Party organisation and he announced his own elevation to cabinet himself. <laughs> Maybe some of this energy will show itself in his new department. The Tarnished has served as deputy leader of the Labour Party for the last seven years, and I'm sure she will be looking forward to Deputy Kelly carrying out his function and providing the support which Deputy Gilmore relied on so much. <laughs> <laughs> deputy, 
Not so sure. Deputy Riley. Deputy Riley has every right to be annoyed. Shh, please. Deputy Riley has every right to be annoyed. We've been presented. We've been presented as the scapegoat. Sorry. The scapegoat for the health sector, which is engulfed in crisis at every level. The policies which Minister Riley has implemented, and against which there has rightly been a growing public backlash, were government policies, not just James Riley's policies, although he has to bear significant responsibility as well. When the campaign to remove medical cards was cranked up, it was on the orders of the government, Minister Howland in particular. When hospitals were given unsustainable budgets, it was on the orders of the government. When scarce resources were diverted to damaging reforms, it was, into, it was to implement the greed Fine Gael and Labour policy. When one million health insurance policies were hiked, it was not Minister Riley alone who did it. It was a government which claimed that it was only hitting gold-plated policies. This year's funding crisis has at its core a decision taken by other ministers at Cabinet to censor the HSC annual plan by insisting that services be maintained even where funding was being withdrawn. A system which had been delivering major improvements in services and doing so within budget has been undermined by a government which will not even acknowledge the cutbacks it is imposing. The announcement on Wednesday of introducing free GP cards to over 70s, while at the very same time removing full medical cards from the same age group, just because they're slightly above the new income criteria that this government introduced, is deeply cynical. The teaching at Tornister have not announced any new direction in health policy. They've not announced the abandonment of the compulsory insurance system or given any credible commitment to protect services. We also need a new direction in the education sector, where cutbacks and ill-judged changes are causing real damage. In education, Labour didn't just break its promises, it did the exact opposite of what it said it would do. Its first cutbacks were against services for disadvantaged pupils and special needs children. Then it hiked third level fees and abolished grants for postgraduate students. Incredibly, it even abolished all dedicated supports for guidance, for guidance and counselling. Are you proud of that in our schools? That was an appalling decision. That was an appalling decision making young people I love the democratic inputs of Labour Party backbenchers who don't even the courtesy to allow people to address the House in the time allotted to them. And the bottom line is this, the bottom line is this, it was a deeply cynical and appalling decision to get rid of guidance and counselling from our schools. Because young people face many challenges in a complex world today and you've denied them that valuable resource which they require. Now no sector, uh, Alaska and Kohler, has so consistently shown an ability to deliver major improvements, and no sector so badly needs a government which believes in respecting uh, professionals. We also need a new direction in policy towards Northern Ireland. Over nearly three years I've repeatedly warned about the impact of the disengagement of our government and the British government, and they've run a policy of leaving everything to Sinn Féin and the DUP and hoping things would work out. Last year our government even nodded in agreement as Sinn Féin and the DUP went off to London to launch a blueprint for the economic future of Northern Ireland, which made no mention of any cross-border or whole island uh, dimension. We need a Minister for Foreign Affairs in Northern Ireland who understands this and starts showing a real commitment to the process of peace, reconciliation and development. The need for new direction in Europe is more obvious than ever. Simply standing to the side and hoping everything works out hasn't worked and won't work. The Taoiseach has yet to outline how he and his government believe the European Union should be reformed to allow it to emerge from the austere policies of the last six years. Ireland has not received full justice for its case in Europe and the government has not yet to even begin articulating a demand, let alone push for it. No, Mr. One. Following the agreement at the June 2012 EU Council meeting, the Taoiseach and the then Taoiseach just spoke about the game changer and how Irish banking debt would be dealt with, but two years later there has been no movement whatsoever. And indeed the Taoiseach's speech confirms now, the Taoiseach's speech confirms now that it, it is... It is indeed Frankfurt's way and not Labour's way that is ruling the roost. Elevates in Fine Gael briefed the media earlier that this week that they wanted education because of the threat to small schools. That's what Fine Gael said they wanted. This is, they did this three years after former Minister Quinn made it clear that he saw small rural schools as inefficient and ripe for rationalisation. And they did the same after the campaign to close rural Garda stations. And the justice system in our country was nearly shattered because of the decisions of Alan Shatter and refused to listen to people's concerns. Likewise, in terms of agriculture and food, and in terms of the needs of rural Ireland. Rural communities need sustainability, and this has to be continued through the pillars of CAP and through central exchequer funding. In the midst of all the pictures and stories today, I'll ask young Cole, about new faces, there is no commitment to a new direction. 
the policy, policies which have so angered the public, the deep unfairness in ma most major decisions, and the two-tiered recovery which even today the government has hailed as its greatest achievement still remain. All we've been offered is a few sound bites intended to resurrect the political and electoral fortunes of Fine Gael and Labour, but which revealed the decision to double down on the policies of the last three and a half years. There's no point talking about giving relief to hard-pressed families when you're pushing ahead with deeply regressive and unfair water and property taxes. There's no point talking about social housing when you're leaving in place rent allowance restrictions which are at the core of the crisis. There's no point claiming to care about health and education when you're continuing with changes Sorry, which are delivering speak, chaos and undermining services. Yeah. The government has said that it wants this Deputy to be a reset that. moment for it. It is nothing of the sort. It is changing some of the faces, but the core strategy, the core unfairness, the core reality of spin and broken promises remains unchanged. Thank you, Laskin.